Okay, so now, here we are, live, um, for for real, how's everybody doing? Here we have, uh, welcome everybody, welcome to episode three of Art and Video Games, and with us are the uh, Rugger of Pixels, Travis Smalley, Planter of Clovers, Hello. Billy Rennekamp, Night Runner, Matto, who's walking and will be on camera soon, and I am the... Um, the uh, uh, moocher of pictorial sensibility, Mitchell F. Chan. <laughs> um, let me put moocher up F. Chan. Uh, moocher F. Chan. Here we go. Let me put up some. Um, let me let, let me put some uh, visual fodder there up on the screen, and um, and uh, and uh, tell me, guys, how are you doing? What's up? What's new? Go ahead. Now you. <laughs> um, it's good. It's a beautiful day in Berlin here. One of, uh, I think, 28 days this month where you can see blue sky. So that's a pretty special occasion. Uh, end of the week, had a lot of fun getting emulators to run on my computer earlier, trying out some of the Cory ROMs, as well as some sneak peek stuff. Uh, was trying to get a lot of Jody ROMs to run. Yeah. Uh, emulators are such an insane concept. Like computer and a computer and digital preservation, all these sort of things come up with, with ROMs, which hopefully we can get into later today. But yeah, doing well. Thanks for asking. No, emulators are so much better than they used to be now. Like, cause I got the one that you recommended to do this episode and I was like, Oh my gosh, this is not a hassle. It's really nice. Yeah. 60 force was what I used to always use. And I, I remember I downloaded a ROM pack that was supposed to be every single N64 game. It was like 545 games or something like that, which was so fun back in like 2008 or something. Mm -hmm. Travis, you probably remember that's when I had my, is that a ROM? What is that? Is that the converter for the this, game controller? This is a Mr. FPGA, which is like hardware emulated consoles. So it's like cycle accurate. It has an FPGA chip. So it like reprograms itself to be like the Yamaha synthesizer for a uh, Sega Genesis or something. So it's, uh, uh, yeah, it's the combination. It's my, uh, it's my device that has everything on it. Wait, can you repeat uh, what you just yeah. said? Being a Yamaha synthesizer for Sega Genesis. So, so like, okay, it has a field programmable gate array, uh, chip in it. Right. And so how those work is that it repro it's a chip that can reprogram itself to be other chips. Okay. And so instead of emulating like a Nintendo, the software aspect of it, it actually emulates all the chips that are inside of a Nintendo. So, you know, for instance, like Sega Genesis, there was like a bunch of different um, sound chips that were on it. And some people prefer one Yamaha sound chip over the other in terms of how Sonic sounds. And you can emulate all of those and to make these uh, accurate, uh, cycle accurate versions of the game. And so whatever it played like, cycle like accurate. Hardware, yeah, go ahead. Well, whatever it played like on the real hardware, it'll play like on there on on the Mister. And it's uh, and also it has like an it has as opposed to the emulators, which will have like a different speed or something like that. I feel like is yeah, that, that yeah. what you're trying to prevent? Exactly, and and it's and it's supposed to be as close as possible to the actual hardware. Like that's the that's the main selling point for it. And then also its ability to convert to HDMI. So it's like the combination of that and then this device here, which is um, hold on, let me pull this out. Uh, the the RetroTink 4K, which mm -hmm. is like a 4K was is a 4K scaler. Um, so the thing that's great about the 4K scaler is that. At 4K, you can simulate CRT uh, filters and uh, at a much higher resolution. So um, it's just been a thing that I've been playing with for the Mister for the last couple of years, and the Retro Tank I got, um, I guess, like right around Christmas time. And um, yeah, we could. It's. I feel like it's a very the kind of it's it's the I, I believe like the audiophile equivalent to old gamer uh, energy. Um, and we could do a whole episode of just like show and tell your favorite hardware objects you have in your like yeah. working space. Oh <laughs> yeah, totally. I feel oh, like I everybody gets out their their wire drawer and just goes through it. Like no, well, this I, cable, let me tell you. That's because also it's like now it's like all, all the different kind of controllers and stuff, right? It's like yeah, I yeah. That's not even talking about controllers and and all the other things of like how do you get the lowest latency responses from 
uh, devices when you're using them with systems. And that's the other thing with Mister is like about keeping latency low as possible, so that when you press jump, you jump at that moment. Oh, man, that is so, far, but, but, so uh, amazing. <laughs> Psycho accurate like, blast processing. That. Yeah, very, very cool geek flex. Yeah, um, it's, I've it's, actually heard that described as well for like game design. One of the most important characteristics you can have is um, high low latency feedback, and 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 not only that, but just sort of like anything that gives you the feeling of like accurately controlling or like having a a real sort of like correlated response you know so so i mean it's also kind of exciting about experimental games too like there was the the playment you know this new uh platform game that came out from panic software where there's like a, a fishing rod you know like like new and interesting ways to interface really their interfaces uh but like high fidelity interface whether at the like hardware latency level or at the like oh i intuitively understand like how my action impacts the game state and, and like Increasing that sort of pull is, is supposed to have like extremely positive uh, results in any sort of gameplay situation. Yeah, and it's because it, I guess like with CRTs, like when the way the signal would go, it would be immediate, right? Like you wouldn't, there wouldn't be this kind of latency that's introduced with modern displays is another part of it too. Um, and, or it's like, I guess like a, there is still latency, but it's a different type of latency or it's way, it's way, it's, it's like thousandths of a second or, as opposed to hundredths or, or tenths of a second of, of latency. Well, as I um, understand it, it actually is worse on modern TVs because modern TVs, they try to do a bunch of stuff that you didn't ask yeah. for, right? It's always my pet peeve when I go home, I visit, I visit my mom. Mom still has her TV on the settings, right, where it came from Best Buy. So it does that frame interpolation to make every single you like you you know you know to 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 scale up um uh all your images first of all to 4k scale up every frame and then you know it, it imagines the different frames in between your old 24 fps right 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 feed and that all takes time and they're really bad settings for playing games i mean it also looks awful right people call it the soap opera yeah. effect it makes everything look like coronation street did you did you see the uh, tom cruise public service announcement when um <laughs> Gun Maverick started coming to televisions about how to turn off motion smoothing for all of your parents' televisions. Uh, God, God bless him, Tom Cruise. God bless him. <laughs> it's yeah that that the that period work. of that period of about a decade ago when you would walk in anywhere and it was just the stretched out image. So it's it's still uh, I don't know. I've never. It, it, I think there's a Seth Price essay about it that came out recently. <laughs> uh, we were talking about like what we did this week. I, I didn't play many games, but I did see like a, a bunch of new kind of developments in terms of like AI within games. Mm -hmm. Like um, like there's this one studio called Altera that's been making AI bots inside of Minecraft. It's like a mod where it's just like you fill up a world with 100 AI agents to play with. Um, there's this other thing called like Amorphous Fortress, uh, which was, um, uh, a kind of generative AI making dungeon crawler. Um, so it's like, I don't know, I think, uh, as, uh, researchers and grad students like start to put out more of these kind of games adjacent AI projects, there'll be some pretty cool emergent things that are, 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 I mean, already are happening, but I'm sure we'll get to see more of those. So that's like what I, I haven't port dove code. deep in either. What's up? All right, please finish. No, I haven't dived. I haven't go, dove go deep ahead. into either of them, but it was just kind of the exciting game news I saw this week is just like a few cool projects that were incorporating this. Um, one of the portfolio companies at the fund that I work for, One KX, uh, is called Upstreet, and I think that's their whole premise is like really easy to use AIs that can be deployed and like. Minesweeper style uh, metaverse environments. Um, their docs and their GitHub stuffs all like very developer friendly. But my my open question about it is sort of just like, but where are these AI agents going and like what are they doing? I I kind of can imagine it a little bit more clearly in in a Minesweeper scenario. Um, I guess that's a trend in general, though. I mean, one that is mine... being called. I'm trying to catch up on notes. 
Uh, oh yeah, I put them in the Twitch planning channel. But uh, Amorphous Fortress is the like roguelike one, or where it's very much like ASCII, kind of changing what associations mean. Uh, the other one was Altera Bot, A L T E R A space bot, the first AI buddy you can play with in Minecraft. Awesome. Yeah, thanks for posting those. I made. <clears throat> oh, I'll post this later for people like who who are watching, but. We, we, we have a Discord, and I made a, a channel just to drop links to everything that we reference on stream. I'm also going to get links to those um, hardware emulators uh, that you have. Um, this, is, oh, yeah. this is really cool. Okay, so the first AI buddy you can play Minecraft with, Alterabot. Yeah, this is, this is really happening, eh? Oh. Yeah, and, and on that Don't forget too, to drop uh, those referral links, too, when you link those, Mitch. We want to be yeah. getting those. <laughs> <laughs> I would say that um, on uh, the kind of that kind of uh, rabbit hole of fidelity and latency, um, Bob's Retro RGB and My Life in Gaming are like two kind of resources for this. My Life in Gaming is the one that like probably five years ago started me down this path of thinking about uh, hardware emulation and CRTs and how we can replicate these in modern displays um, and kind of the experience of playing a super nintendo game on a crt versus um uh, lcd screen so i'll add those too yeah awesome and then travis the other thing that i wanted to, to ask you about is yeah, uh, yeah you got to see some exhibitions you got to see some exhibitions uh down in new york this week right yeah i saw one i, I new saw, york I city saw, new york city <laughs> i went i went down i went down there <laughs> out of the mountains uh, uh, from Rhode Island. Now, I, <laughs> there are no mountains here. Um, I went, uh, uh, John Preventure invited me to be part of the most recent round of Fruitful School courses. Mm -hmm. And I did a day long workshop and it was on generative systems and kind of how my kind, my kind of workflow in terms of thinking about scripting on and different operating systems and scripting with creative software. Um, but part of it was, as I was like, okay, I'm down here for this very short period of time. Let's just make it part of the class that we go there. And so we took a field trip to the Whitney to see the Harold Cohen show. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, so when I got into generative systems like a decade ago, it, I he was one of the first people that came up for me, right? And, but it was all online. Like I was just looking at PDFs. I was looking at reproductions. And so it was really great to kind of be in the space and get to see the work in person. Like in in as much as I'd studied him, I didn't really understand about the Kurzweil KCAT uh, screensaver that they made together. Like my, my knowledge went from like 70s and 80s and then skipped all the way to 2010 when he made this touch screen and started doing it. Like I missed a lot of the things. And so it was really cool to kind of fill in those gaps. But even more than that, it was getting to see his sketchbooks uh, and his notes that he was taking as he was building the program. Because I think that if you ask anyone who's like involved in generative systems, like you, we have these drawings, you have yeah. these kind of logic maps of like, okay, I need this to be here and here and here. And, oh, man, I would love to just look through all of them. Of course, I wish the show was, like, three times as big as it was, like, and um, it was, but, uh, yeah, it was it was really exciting to see. What was the Ray Kurzweil thing, though? I hadn't, I've never heard about this, uh, right? uh, and reviewers, Ray Kurzweil, just give a little background on him, too, maybe. Um, uh, so, Ray, Ray Kurzweil's a singularity guy, right? He's the guy who, um, um, the kind of exponential curve of processing, right? And I, I feel like probably Billy, you would do a better job of explaining who he is than I. I would. I mean, he's just like the transhumanist poster child. You know, the singularity is near. I think he maybe even coined the term singularity, and he has like a couple books which just sort of like predict technology that'll come. You know, it'll be like nanobot clouds that reassemble into new, you know, household objects and stuff like that, and like what needs to happen before those things. So he's like super far out futurist. Uh, but then he was the head of AI at Google recently. I think he was there when they started doing AI predictive text inside of Gmail. He wrote an AI book relatively recently. He's just sort of a poster child, but his his background is all the way back into like, I think uh, voice synthesis and uh, a lot of computer aid for various types of, um, you know, uh, disabilities, whether it's blind computing or voice assistant and things like that. So. He has sort of like a legitimate patent history of like pushing the envelope forward. And then in the last years has become more notorious as like a future predicting technologist, transhumanist. 
also very importantly, he ha ran a musical instrument company and made some very important early samplers uh, that were some of the like first like programmable samplers that had like a real impact on music technology back in the, I would say, late 80s, early 90s. Uh, and I think maybe that's where he made his money before he started to get into the crazy futurist stuff, or or maybe those were in parallel. But uh, yeah, I remember like lusting after those Kurzweil samplers back in the day. Yeah. Nice. Okay, so let's, what was yeah, the so, collaboration? There was a Yeah, that was Kurzweil, yeah. yeah. But you were at the Harold Cohen exhibition at the at the Whitney Museum. And yeah, I wasn't, Cohen I wasn't aware of that. <laughs> yeah, so, so, so Harold Cohen uh, was a pretty established painter in London in the 50s. 50s and 60s like uh, he was he had won awards like he sold his work and he had a friend who was at Stanford who was like hey you should come out here come to the west coast um, come, come to Stanford and when he gets out there he starts to work with computers and at first he makes these really beautiful topographical maps of numbers um, and then shortly after starts working towards what Aaron his Hebrew name which was this piece of software that um that made drawings with him and he started from this place of like with petroglyphs and trying to recreate things that he would see on hikes that looked very uncomputer like uh and this is like in the mid 70s he it seems like he very much was like he would pitch it to museums like he pitched it to the sf moma he pitched it to the Steglick. like hey i have this turtle this little turtle that will go around the space and make these drawings and it's like about like an artist working with the computer to make make drawings which then developed into figurative work in the 80s uh to increasingly complex plotters that would paint um and 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 by the yeah by the by the end of his life he had these touchscreen tablets that were about that he could kind of work with Aaron to make these works. Um, it, it was, it was awesome to see. It was, the thing is, I think for me, the one like bummer was that, and it makes sense because the show I think was framed around AI and well, the two bummers were, I wish it was way bigger. I wish there was way more notebooks, but then it was, I feel like it was positioned around AI where for me, I've always thought about his work from the place of like artist and programmer like from this kind of collaboration that while I guess like you can frame it in terms of AI and like the kind of outputs and, and latent space of possibilities or something. Um, I, I've always related to it from this place of I'm an artist who wants to make things and I want to make these programs that can help me do it and kind of I can respond to and keep working on. Um, like, I guess like maybe just like a slightly different dialogue, which in its way, I guess could be also be called AI too. But, um, but yeah, it was, it was, I was, it was say, really I can important. imagine like an earlier use of, Earlier use of AI feeling a lot more appropriate, but that term has just gone through so many hype cycle waves, redefinitions, associations that at least the current one I could imagine, yeah, is being a bit. My my biggest appointment, disappointment looking at this now is to find out that the turtle doesn't have a shell on it because that is a huge <laughs> missed opportunity for a really cute little critter going around here. I mean, as a as a turtle lover with uh, some turtle shell artworks here yeah. next to my desk, that's just a, a big loss. You mean uh, they did have custom this, this drawing turtle? Yeah. Yeah, I forgot. Um, Not that uh, one. There's another one, uh, the earlier one. Uh, yeah, I, I actually found out. Hold on one second. I I found out the guy who made these. Uh, what's his name? Uh, they they were custom built for the for the show. Um. Um, Bantam Tools. Yeah, there they are. <clears throat> Bree Pettis of Bantam, Bantam tools. tools is the person who made them. Those also aren't the turtles. Look in the look in the Twitch. Oh, uh, chat stream. I just gave you a, a picture. Oh, here we go. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. This is great. Um, this they is were great. they're really chunky. They were nice. They they had a kind of. Um, a kind of build your own computer, build your own gaming PC energy to them that I liked. Um, yeah. But it's interesting that you say that, Travis, about, you know, the focus being on AI, because I've actually heard that from a number of, of other artists, and especially artists who, who work with technology, that this is not representative of the current, you know, state of, of, of AI. But I, I think it's actually really important that this exhibition be framed as an AI exhibition, because now that we are in this moment where AI means something different, 
I do think it's valuable to recall the ways that we used to understand the notion of artificial intelligence, right? We think, look, even in video games, we talk about an enemy's AI, right? We talk about, oh, this game is just ter terrible enemy AI. That is nowhere near the AI that we're seeing, you know, from, from large models and chat GPT or anything like that. They really are just algorithms. They are just procedural behavior. And one of the things that I loved about this exhibition was thinking about it as like returning to the roots of what AI used to mean. Because all these drawings, right? Obviously, AI drawings, AI artworks, they're, they're, they're everywhere now. If you're in the sort of dank corner of Twitter that we're all in, you can't get away from seeing hundreds and thousands of people's AI outputs. And it is, um, you know, whatever you think about prompt artists right or how much art goes into you know engineering prompts to get a certain style of image out of mid-journey or out of dolly or anything like that you know cohen's ai i'm going to use the finger quotes ai drawings just have a distinctness and a style to them right and a uniqueness that only comes from a clear and thorough understanding of exactly what tangled spaghetti of an algorithm right his prompts are going through and like i weirdly just ended up with a kind of nostalgia for that level of control over a computer generated output i was just thinking about that distinction and it's not i mean it's it's augmenting intelligence i just googled augmented intelligence and it turns out that there has been this distinction since the, the 50s the other term for augmented intelligence is IA intelligence amplification, which I guess is a is a pretty useful distinction, I think, you know, because it's it's about losing that fidelity between the sort of like uh, original uh, our skill identity input, you know, of the artist and being amplified rather than having this sort of like lost along the way for being able to understand where the results even came from. Yeah, I mean, yeah, this exactly. is something that goes back. I've actually got a paper sitting here open on my computer that's from I think 1950 or something from Doug Engelbart titled Augmenting, Augmenting Human Intellect, a Conceptual Framework. So this is definitely like, a, which is which is I think an important paper and, and worth checking out um, in 1962. Um, but I think that the, this idea of amplification and also like the the thing that I think everybody's reacting to in the current machine learning neural network um, era is that, you know, a lot of people talk about like generative art or kind of like procedural, you know, systems like what we're talking about with Harold Cohen as having this element of indirection and loss of control uh, or, or seeding of control, right? There's this like kind of painting with a long brush kind of idea, but the now that we get into the neural phase um it's becoming so that that indirection is becoming so amplified right like the the loss of control is way more magnified and the system is starting to feel like it has some kind of agency or you know much more kind of these like softer springier um forms of intelligence where it's not just going to like error out or produce a white screen if you give it a strange prompt it'll like give you back something strange um and i think that's very alienating for a lot of people um but also like where this rhetoric around intelligence is kind of changing the other thing when i <clears throat> went to the exhibition um because i was there I, I was there a couple weeks ago um on the member preview and you know you mentioned like the 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 notes the notebooks that they have they are so awesome like if you are at all interested in in coding you will love looking through these things and i wish they had um i mean and we got to we got to figure out who we can bother to to get access yeah. <laughs> to those archives i agree like, and, totally. and, and the, the, there were, especially actually, if you love video games, there's a bunch of stuff in here. So this is like Travis said, it's a fairly small exhibition, right? But but it's it is super tight and it is expertly yeah. curated. And yeah. look, so often when I go through, um, you know, when I go through an exhibition, I often skip the vitrines full of ephemera. You know, like I I, I don't need to see, you know, like I I don't need necessarily need to see, you know. Pablo's love letters to, you know, Mary Therese or whatever, right? 
But these notebooks, they're 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 inspiring. They're illuminating. They're edifying. And like Travis said, and you're thank you by the way for that very succinct and informative uh, uh, breakdown, uh, in, like in introduction to Harold Cohen. This is a painter who was able to steer the development of this the artificial intelligence algorithm to make drawings and he has no programming background but he has an incredible clarity of thought about how he makes pictures and because he had that clarity of thought in terms of how he did one thing he is able to translate that clarity of thought into the language of computers and these are amazing documents you see in his sketchbook some of my favorite ones were he was making, he made a diagram of how to calculate occlusion in his, in his paintings, right? Um, and because in something like, uh, right, in something like this, this is really interesting. He's making these, he's making these uh, programs, these instructions for that turtle that we briefly saw down there for a drawing machine. Which means unlike if you're creating a sketch to draw in processing, right, you just draw over every pixel and you don't even have to think about what visual elements are occluding others. But because this is for a drawing machine, as he generates his image, he has to understand that one of these bathers is in front of another bather and both bathers are in front of the foliage in the background. And you just see in his notes, him very eloquently thinking through this problem as a painter, how his brain understands what should be drawn and what should not based on its spatial relationship in the scene. And, you know, if you've ever made a video game or if you've ever made 3D graphics, if you've read a book about John Carmack programming like Doom and Wolfenstein, you understand this was a major problem for software developers like for for years. And it is insane to see a painter solve that in, in painting language. And there are numerous examples of this through the vitrines. He also had this other sketch. I should have taken photos while I was at the exhibition and um, where he was trying to save memory, all right, by not recording data in large areas where there was nothing drawn. And so he, he starts to draw up, out squares where there's, where, 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 you know, um, uh, you know, okay, this is a big area with no data. And then there's a smaller area, a smaller area. And he's essentially invented, like, he, he, he's invented JPEG compression, like by himself, like sort of independently of that happening. And like before these standards actually existed, from what I can tell, they're just amazing. That's the leaf, right? Where you get the square. Yeah, I, that was such a beautiful drawing. It was incredible. Yeah. Um, there's yeah, a, I there is um, correspondence it's, type. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna say this is. I'm, I'm sure. Gonna it's I'm gonna, I'm gonna veer to a little bit. This. Yeah, it's boring for me to talk about this without the without the visual aid. But also for 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 these characters, there's another drawing where he's like going through all of the bones, and he's like basically just kind of figuring out like programming and verse kinematics. You know, like in in a painterly way. It's awesome stuff. Um, this makes me think of, I was in the Korea over the holidays and went to the Namjoon Pike uh, Museum uh, Institute, whatever it's called. And there was this book that I tried to buy. They only had one display copy left, so I couldn't get it. So I just spent like the whole time looking at it. And it was correspondence between Namjoon Pike and uh, Shuya Abe, his like Japanese engineering assistant's counterpart who for the most of his life worked for like a big engineering company in Japan and would just help Namjoon Pike via like correspondence or like for designated trips and things like that. And all of these letters were so funny to me because it was just like, it's the bulk of almost all of this work, which is like apologizing for being delayed, complaining about money, trying to figure out like chorus, like where are we going to move this thing? Oh my God, I'm so sorry. I don't know where I'm going to find the money. This Sorry, I have $15.67 in my bank account right now. I'm going to borrow $15 from so-and-so and send you a check next week. And it's just like, it's the modicum. It's so vapid, but it's like actually how these things get done. And also like cute little like bright statements or like 
you know, tragic statements in between of this like relationship. But like, you know, there's so many moving pieces, especially for like technology based artwork and the relationships that make them happen are such an unseen but important part of the whole mechanism, you know, and to have that be the full focus of this book. Like you don't see a single artwork, you see some sketches, et cetera, but mostly it's just like trying to be nice to each other to figure out like a, a fucking hard technical problem. And one guy's got a full-time job in Tokyo and he's like taking time. I guess by the end of his life, he was able to quit and work for Namjoon Pike full-time. Um, but really great book, apparently very in scarce supply. So I don't know how well I'll ever be able to get a hold of them. Uh, if you're in Korea, apparently there's a couple that you can order, but they don't do interna- international shipping. So uh, Pike Abe Correspondence, if you, if you want to check it out, we'll keep those in the show notes too. One last thing about the the vitrines. Mm-hmm. I remember uh, years ago at MoMA, there was a Picabia show. And in the show, because Picabia made lots of books and, and zines and or early, early versions of what a zine would be. Uh, and what they did is they had them in vitrines so you could see the actual one. But then they also had tablets there so you could flip through it. And and I just I I think that's a really awesome gesture when you get that kind of complete documentation in the space to kind of look through it because I know exhibiting books can be uh, difficult right in terms of like a book as a book that you can look through um, but while maybe not a perfect solution I thought that that was like that did the job like it let me see experience it and at least what was going on in it. Yeah, absolutely. I checked the gift shop. They didn't have a, a, like a, a nice thick catalog of this while I was there. Nah. So, uh, they got to do that. Well, that's great. I'm glad that you had a. Uh, I'm, gl- I'm glad you had a, a great trip down there to New York. And I know you you saw it too, right, Matto? Yeah, that's. No, I actually haven't seen the Harold Cohen. I've got oh. a couple of friends who I want to go with, and we've been like trying to coordinate to go together. So I've been actually. It's here in my home city, so it's kind of funny. But I've been like holding off uh, to go with uh, to go with a couple of friends. The show that I did see, or the kind of two shows, were the Simon Denny uh, solo show, and then the um, curated show that were kind of in the same building. Yeah, um, w- which were which were both really great. Uh, we looked at some of the work on the last show, some of the um, Suzanne Trister paintings Mm -hmm. uh which they had two of them there the one that was on the invitation and then the one uh what is that i saved i took a picture on my phone about like you're you're encountering an error um which i was very very happy to see and then the uh and actually that essay that we found uh during the last show i ended up reading um and kind of dove into her world a little bit uh i can find the find the link and put it in the channel so that we can share it with other people. But it was super, super interesting. Um, I got like very focused on her and her work after, after our, after our last show. And, you know, she had this whole story of, she was a painter in London. It was actually like a boyfriend of hers. It was really into arcade games. So they would like go and like hang out in the arcade. Uh, And then um, she started making these paintings uh oil paintings that would kind of reference video games but then at a certain point kind of realized oh actually you know if i want to really do this i need to move into digital media so she bought an amiga early amiga with like no hard drive and like floppy disks um and started making these paintings um it's just a the whole essay is really interesting her kind of process through it and then she went on to do all this other really interesting work about where she had this kind of alter ego and this whole complex world building thing about like the cold war and the Holocaust and time travel and um, just a super, super interesting artist. Um, So I'll, I'll find the link for the essay for people to check out, but then, you know, tying it back to our kind of shared interest in like um, crypto art, you know, there's all these links in the essay of like, Oh, and there's the actual, the original discs were corrupted, but there's some scans of the images on this website and that website, and all the links are dead. Um, yeah, which was just like fuck, like really tough, you know. Um, I think this essay is like from the '90s, um, but yeah, so that was very, very cool to see those pieces. And then Simon's work is like very directly um, relating to games. Uh, kind of referencing games in a bunch of different ways. Um, yeah, so these things that you're scrolling through are from the 
from the curated exhibition from other artists and then so there was a couple of sculptures which were like 3d printed blow-ups of um yeah that's one piece from the simon show so this is a t-shirt worn by a game of thrones t-shirt worn by grimes I and then there's like a power so there's a a power strip that was like from the liquidation of the Twitter offices is like what's in there under it in the, you know, so it's got all this connection to like weird tech culture. The, the, the thing you can see in the background there was this like a uh, hero quest, which was this like D and D board game board. He like blew up these paintings. There's also some paintings of, uh, of uh web averse for those who remember that from last year or two years ago, which was like an NFT project with these apartments. Uh, mm -hmm. And he like made paintings of some of those apartments. It was very surprising to see. Um, yeah, it was an interesting show. Uh, yeah, this painting, actually, this is a detail, but this really was like actually weirdly one of the more impactful things. It's all these old D&D &D ads mm -hmm. uh, kind of embedded in this painting from like the 80s to the 2000s. And a bunch of them had been in comics that I read when I was like 10, you know, so there was this like palpable hit of nostalgia to see them again. Like if he had like cut them out of the paintings, out of the comics and glued them into the painting. Um so yeah, it was a cool show um, and definitely kind of like relevant to our interests here. I felt like the the curated show minus the Suzanne Treister paintings, which had this more direct connection to games, was a little more tangential mm -hmm. feeling. Like, yeah, some of these works, like I, it didn't feel the, the kind of ref, the multi-user dungeon framing. I was kind of hoping he would be a little more literal with that and connect because obviously MUDs and, you know, for those who don't know, right, MUDs mm -hmm. were like some of the original online role-playing games, text-based uh, multi-user worlds that I think were like really, really important um, kind of things in gaming history and interesting art objects in and of the, or debatable whether they're art, right, but creative artifacts in and of themselves um, that I think was just more of like a loose conceptual framing for this. Um but, uh, but yeah, it was, it was really cool. That's awesome. And Travis, did you get to see this while you were down there? No, I was there for one day. So it's just <clears> right like on. in and out, but I, but I did, I've, I've never met Simon in person. And oh, really? I was getting, I was getting breakfast with John and he walked into the same place we were getting breakfast. And I was just like, and it was like, as we had just been talking about the show yeah. and I was just like, I think that's Simon. And I went up and introduced him. Sure enough, it was, he was very very sweet, very nice person. That's that, that's that's so great. Well, I, I'm glad you got to see the exhibition, um, Matt, because yeah, we were talking about it last week. See, here on art and video, we're, we're not just we're not just pamping stuff. We 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 stand by. We show up for all this stuff that we talk <laughs> about here. You know, there, there are no there 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 are, there are no paid placements here on this on this pedestal. Uh, that's that's really awesome. Yeah, I was ticked I couldn't make it. Um, they are our genuine interests. Much travel. Yeah, they are our genuine interests. Um, that's, that's, that's fantastic. Um, so is, is, if we're, are, we, are we caught up on our week? Should we, should we play some Cory Archangel? Let's do it. We could do that. I mean, you haven't told us much about your week, except for you mentioned some nonogram. I'm, I'm curious how, how deep oh. down that rabbit hole you ended up going. I, I, I went real, I went real deep. I, I, I went really deep into it. Um, I, I, I played some nonograms. Billy, every game that you introduce into, into my world ends up becoming a big hit, like, uh, amongst my family. Okay, so now my five-year-old is really into, like, doing the simple five-by-five five ones. Whoa. Yeah. Um, They're so, so fun. I mean, that's such a satisfying end. I love to hear that. Yeah. So, 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 so that's that's been really great. Um, I uh, uh, last night uh, downloaded newly released on Switch from Xbox Studios the uh, 16th century Germany yes. murder mystery game Pentiment. Oh. Um, I can't wait to hear you okay, talk I, about this. this is, just, I'm so excited for this. I just got it last night. I will. I'll let you know. I'll let you know how it goes. Uh, it's it's so it takes a lot. It's heavily influenced by Name of the Rose, which is like one of my favorite movies. Mm -hmm. So I'm um, yeah yeah I'm it, it's and also it's Obsidian right. So there's like a lot of proc gen. There's like a lot of kind of uh, emergent systems. I think at play in it. Yeah, I I would love to 
I would love to hear what you have to say about it. I haven't touched it. Yeah. I, yeah, I will. Um, I, 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 I've just done the first 15 minutes enough to define, you know, my character as, you know, I, I, I am a European fine artisan um, heading to Nuremberg. I'm something, something of a cad, uh, get along well with the ladies and uh, we're going to, we're going to figure it out. So yeah, I'm, I'm living my best, my best uh, 16th century European fine artisan life. Yeah, I've heard a lot of good things about this. I haven't actually played it yet myself, um, but the, some people I really respect have played it and really loved it. And I actually love the idea of this. I don't know. It's a, it's a different take on the kind of slice of life game, right? It's like more focused on like Im immersing in this period in this world, obviously without a lot of like combat and quests and stuff. Uh, it's pretty pretty bold thing to do. Um, and especially kind of like with the budget that they have. So I'm, I'm very interested to, to try it as well. Yeah, it is weird to see a game that niche carry the, like open with the words Xbox Game Studios presents, you know? Yeah. It's cool, though. I mean, I wonder if we like, I wonder what we can read from that in the sense that I think there's an interesting thing going on in games right now as a, that may give rise to more things like that because there's a, a kind of a serious problem of um, as hardware and fidelity slows down, the kind of like obsolescence cycle of games is kind of sputtering, right? Like it used to be that a game from five years ago was just like absolutely um, kind of seen to be outdated uh, compared to whatever the new game on the new hardware would be. Um, and the, but now that is kind of plateaued. And so games are kind of piling up, right? All these games are like mm -hmm. remain viable, right? It's yeah, like, they're well, still game, good. Like, yeah, like Skyrim is still good, <laughs> right? Skyrim is how old now, but it's still good, right? People are still definitely playing it. And so what that, does to the market is forces now you have to compete against skyrim red dead redemption and gta 6 right so mm -hmm. now there's this pressure increased pressure to differentiate and to stand out and i think as aesthetics as a vector is definitely gonna like the fact that you see xbox bankrolling a game like this kind of tells you okay we're not going to be able to differentiate on a kind of a technical basis or even, and like the whole idea of a lot of indie games was like, oh, we would have like one weird mechanic, right? Like Fez, mm -hmm. we've got rotating 2D, 3D graphics, right? Oh my God, right? But now even that well, I think is running a little bit dry. And so now we're starting to see kind of weirder stuff like this, like, okay, yeah, we're gonna be making a game about 16th century German monks. Um, and that I think is, I, I find from the kind of art and video games standpoint, I find that actually very promising and hopeful um, because it's no longer this kind of like technological, teleological narrative. And now it's more like, okay, what are we going to do with these materials? Yeah, a hundred percent. Like, like that's, that, that's the hope of, it, 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 and it's already happened on the hardware level, right? Where the winner of this hardware generation is actually the weakest hardware. So it's it's actually yeah. it's it's not about it's it's not about getting the most ray traces anymore, right? It's not about getting the most polygons. It really is like the the values are coming back to game design and doing something unique there. So that's an encouraging thing, right? That's an encouraging yeah. thing. <clears throat> so here we are. That's just what I want to the really yeah, I think the, the other thing we Yeah, go ahead. Just the last yeah, thing I want to say about Pentiment is uh you know, Pentiment has 5,000 reviews at, uh, what's the price? I can't see it on the little screen, but. Uh, 25 bucks it, Canadian. Yeah, so let's say that's probably 20 bucks US. So that's, I would assume that they will, it's a question actually, whether they'll be profitable with that number of sales now, but it's definitely, um, approaching commercial viability and i think something like this will have like a great long tail life so if this can kind of prove as a commercial success for 
Xbox and Obsidian, um, you know, we may see like more more things like this. One last thing related to Pentiment too is that this Wednesday, so two days ago at University of Rhode Island where I teach, they had invited uh, Dr. Karen Cook to come and she gave this talk about renaissanceism in video games. And so it was looking at how music from Baroque, Renaissance and Middle Ages have been deployed in video games. And it kind of ends like everyone in the crowd was like, what do you think of Pentiment? And in and, and terms mm. of like from this kind of musical historian perspective. And also she, she was looking a lot at just the sound design. Like how does, how does the Middle Ages sound in video games? How does the Renaissance sound in video games? Not that like, she's like, they, like the same cow sound that might be used for Minecraft is often used in a game about the Renaissance and like what that means for how you play through it. And, um, she, I just want to mention it because apparently that there's like a this one Twitch channel called Bardic Knowledge. It's like mm -hmm. one word, Bardic Knowledge, which is a lot of people that are like in the music sound design, but academia side and, and they just play games and talk about it. So I thought that was really fascinating because, um, yeah, these kind of these kind of games feel really special and that they kind of they end up getting historians and other people involved that like um, uh, it, it's, it's cool to see how that it gets embedded in games. Did medieval cows sound different? I right. I don't know. She was like her. Her point was she's like every game uses like the same. We'll use like there's like a few cow sounds that get used mm -hmm. in every game, and it's like what does it mean to have like what would that sound like at, like in in a field versus like in a city? And it was just talking about how in sound design like this sounds that are used, and I, I love that idea of like what does a medieval world sound like. Mm -hmm. I mean, it seems like pretty fertile territory. Like it's already exciting enough to have some sort of real experience of what was it kind of like back then that you don't have to do too much else in the game experience. And obviously this relies heavily on the kind of like authentic historians, uh, which reminds me earlier this week, I watched Man in the Iron Mask, like 1995, Leonardo DiCaprio, uh, French Revolution mm -hmm. era. And man, they, they really just phoned in all of the historical accuracy stuff back then. It just felt like <laughs> the bar was much lower. <laughs> I mean, the movie's great for it, but uh, it's, it's, a, it's great to see historical accuracy uh, entering the video game realm, I guess is the, the point of that note. Cool. All right. So that was <clears throat> Pentiment. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll play some more Pentiment and uh, I'll, let you know. I'll let you know how it goes. I want to play it too. Great. Well, that's our first it. hour of just catching up on how everybody's yeah. doing this week. Should we get into the games that we're here to play? Yeah. All right. Let's 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 deliver. Let's deliver that premium A one content. I gotta say, I may have been procrastinating intentionally a little bit because th th this week's this week's subject is daunting. I feel a little bit nervous. Right. I feel like you know. I feel like I, I imagine it's as though I've just taken over writing duties on like Batman and now like my third issue is we're going to do like a Joker story you know like we're going to really hit um the, the the heart of the rogues gallery because we are talking about Cory Archangel and I think that although I mean certainly nobody would call Cory Archangel a rogue but if you did he would he would definitely be the heart of the rogues gallery of recent you know video game related art yeah, I, I, am I right do you disagree I think so. I think we're talking canon here. We got we got some blue chip aspects. We got big Whitney shows. We got references that people who are vaguely familiar with the topic seem to pick up on. And so, uh, well, maybe the way to Bring start, Travis, you did you were wonderful at introducing us to 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 Harold Cohen uh, and uh, and Ray Kurzweil. Uh, could you or or Billy give us kind of a, a brief intro to to Corey Corey Archangel? Uh, Corey's <laughs> one of my favorite artists. <laughs> yeah, um, I I don't know. It's like uh, where to start. So Corey comes from music, right, Billy? Mm -hmm. Like he he was he 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 came from a music background, and he I think of him in terms of having this this kind of was it was he with Tony Conrad too? Was that part of it as well? Like. He um he he was studying music and then that. that led there's a an overlap between him and the paper rat people early on so this kind of um I think of like 
proto extreme animals, them traveling around the country doing shows where uh, this this work that was done on like hacked cartridges on Nintendo cartridges was shown at events. Um, I actually, now that I'm talking, I'm like realizing I don't know that much about the super early days of Corey, and it's maybe like all a mashup. They're, um, they're Oberlin. Oberlin kids. It was all okay. Jacob Kiyochi, Paul B. Davis, and they made Beige, like the collective. And yeah, I, I think he was studying uh, guitar, maybe even or like classical it was, guitar. It was guitar. He was a classical guitarist. Like is a classical guitarist. Once and always the same. Um, and, but but keep it up. You're you're doing good. I mean, oh okay. I can fill in what little I know. <laughs> I fell on the spot. Um, uh, so I think that for me, when I was in undergrad, so this is like uh, 2004 to 2010, that kind of period. Um, I feel like everything I wanted to make, he had already made. Um, <laughs> in terms of in terms of thinking about creative software and the artist's role in creative software, in terms of the artist's role in operating systems and the vernacular of operating systems and what it means to create in them. Um, his, pl- his pieces often had a humor associated with them. Um, I, I think about, uh, I think about his glockenspiel addendum for the, for a Bruce Springsteen, where you take, you take this recording of an album and just add glockenspiel to it and put it back out into the wild so that you might walk into a coffee house <laughs> one day and you hear Bruce Springsteen with the glockenspiel. And that's just like, that's how like things diffuse from pirated music. Um, can, can uh, we can we pause there? Because that is that is yeah, sure. maybe that's one of my favorite. Yeah, favorite me too. Pieces. <laughs> and it because it, yeah. it it does everything and it does it so well. So as a recap to explain what this is, okay, Corey Archangel's Born to Run Glockenspiel Addendum works thusly. Corey Archangel had listened to the ba- to the album Born to Run by Bruce Springsteen, as, as many have. And Corey Archangel had noted that many of the tracks on Born to Run have glockenspiel on them, but many do not. And he saw an opportunity to add more glockenspiel to Born to Run. So he, he wrote and performed glockenspiel parts only for the tracks that did not already have them, okay? He was very respectful of the original <laughs> Glockenspiel work of Danny Federici, rest in peace, okay? And, right, we was not trying to compete with E Street Band member Danny Federici. Mixes them down over top of the regular album and burns those CDs. And the idea is that as people, I mean, what he says on the website is that, you know, when people would burn the CDs because the track lengths were all identical, iTunes at the time would read it as Born to Run. But obviously, if you were on Kazaa, or LimeWire, or, um, you know, if you were torrenting your files, these would get thrown into the world as Born to Run. And they were almost indistinguishable, except that there was this version out there with slightly more glockenspiel, right? And some of my favorite performance artworks, some of my favorite conceptual artworks, they all have this property this feeling of throwing watercolors into the ocean where you make just an infinitesimally small difference in the world and you allow it to be diluted. And maybe, you know, maybe what you've done washes up on shore somewhere else, but maybe not. It's just, it's happened. It's a gesture. And it is the most beautiful gesture of throwing watercolors into the ocean of digital file sharing culture, right? Like it's it's such a beautiful piece. Yeah, that's a good uh, description of like a, a characteristic that runs through a lot of his works. Um, around that college time, that Travis and I were at school at the same time. Uh, I did an internship for him in a summertime and worked on some things that felt kind of the same. It almost felt like he was asking me to do like private performative art or something like that. For example, uh, there was a VHS loop of, God, I can't remember what it was now. I want to say it was like a Subway CCTV or something like that. 
had me like manually loop that from one VHS to another in like 10 minute segments, just like mundane, repetitive task. And the other one was there was a New York Times wrote a series of articles in the like 1970s Olympics when the US hockey team uh, was a, you know, underdog against Russia's domineering surefire winner. And they ended up winning. It was this huge sports upset. And so there was like a small book that got published with all the New York Times articles about it. And so he had me read the book and make a text file that would be an addendum to Microsoft Word's uh, spell check. So that if there were any word, if somebody were to write an academic paper about this event and there was any like names or specific vocabulary that was so specific to this that like Microsoft Word would underline it in red, they would be able to use this text file to supplement that dictionary and say, no, no, that's not a misspelling. That's a, that's a real word. So like the output was this text file, just like, where is this going? And like, to what purpose forever would it be useful? It's just, yeah, as you described, kind of throwing wallet colors into the ocean. And you had um, to so I, I mean, I didn't feel bad because it kind of felt, yeah, I did these tasks as like, you know, a, a 19 year old uh, working in a coffee shop and then running over to Cory Archangel studio to, to repeat these VHS copy mechanisms, et cetera. That was a great, great summer though. I interned for Rhizome that summer. I interned for Cory that summer and I interned for a gallery that was run by who would later become Cory Archangel's wife, uh, art since the summer of 69. And I worked oh, at the yeah. cake shop as a, as a barista. That was uh, the summer that we lived in the cave too. I think uh, Travis, you were maybe room. We were in room. I was there. Even. Yeah, yeah. Also, I'm also from the Rhizome intern uh, lineage. Uh, yeah, no. Th there's there's a piece he has. I I actually talked about it this weekend for the fruitful school thing, where it's uh, okay. So it's called on and on. It's from 2013, and it's here's the code: an Apple script bot which will broadcast to Facebook through Spotify that the user listens to Far East movements like a G6 on repeat every night from 7 p.m. to 5 a.m. So that, like the whole script was just that it would make it so that if you went to Facebook, you would see like, why is this person listening to this song? Travis, every night? Night. Okay. All night. <laughs> Travis, Travis I, I, I have a personal anecdote about this. I have a personal anecdote oh, about God. this. Okay. This is here. Everybody, look, look we're going to tell you, this is, this is a world premiere secret that I have. I also saw that exact same piece like 10 years ago. He just published the instructions for it in a journal, right? And I remember seeing it and thinking, oh, that's, that's so funny. I should do that. It's a really easy Apple script to, 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 to install, but I never did. And then about a year ago, I was driving around with my wife and my wife says to me, apropos of nothing, she says, do you remember who was that artist who made that artwork? where it was just like you were supposed to look like you were listening to this song over and over. And I said, oh yeah, that was Corey Archangel. What was that? And this was about a year ago. And, you know, you know look, sometimes the little art world that we live in feels like a bit of a bummer. I'm overall a pretty happy guy. I like my life. But, you know, sometimes it feels like you're in this art world and nobody, nobody in digital art right now seems to be able to rip a fart without making a tweet thread about how it's like the first incorporation of a blockchain state machine that ever, whatever. And, you know, it bums me out sometimes. But I thought about this piece by Corey Archangel on and on, and it, it, and it made me really happy. Now, I've, I've never met Corey Archangel, so I, I don't know him like, 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 like you guys, but I emailed him. And I said, you know, dear Mr. Archangel, I was driving the other day, my wife remembered your piece, and I thought I'd like to do that. But my problem is that nobody uses Facebook anymore, right? This, this original artwork is supposed to make it look on Facebook, like you listen to the song on and on by Far East Movement every night. I said, would you mind if I changed, you know, your project so that it was showing up on Discord? All right. And, and, and I offered I, and I said, and, you know, I would be really happy. I'd like to pay you an exhibition fee to do this because, you know, I'll consider this an exhibition of the work. And after about a week, he got back to me and said, hey, this is a really nice email. Look, go ahead and change it. You know, here's the repo, whatever. You don't have to pay me anything. And so I did. And I set up and I was running that for a month. And I told, no, 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 sorry. I was running it for two weeks and I didn't tell anybody about it. 
I didn't tell anybody that I was doing it. There's no tweet about it. But every night I would see on my Discord, my status on the right, it would say listening to On and On by Far East Movement. And it just made me happy. Like it just made me really happy that I had this artwork happening that nobody else knew about. And it was like a real just just ray of joy in kind of a dim digital art winter. Um, and so anyway, if you ever watch this, Corey Archangel, that, you know, you didn't, it, it cheered me up. That, it, it, running that artwork really cheered me up for a couple of weeks. And then at the end of the year, when I got my Spotify wrapped, you know, my, my most played track by far, <laughs> which I did, yeah. Far East Movement, hundreds of times, like a G6. <laughs> Lovely, lovely. And, okay, and so we've um, talked well, about we, all we, these. We could fanboy what he's all done. day. Oh, good. Yeah, we and, could. We haven't really talked this... about his games. Like, we're, yeah, yeah. we haven't talked I'm bringing about... it up. Yeah, like, okay. So, so. Uh, cool. Now we got to be harsh. We fanboyed enough, yeah. Corey. Now yeah, we can we shit all over you, and we did our part <laughs> by letting you know how much we like your work. Um, let's, uh, let me bring this up. And so, so, so Billy, maybe you can, can you, can you set up, I'm going to put on Super Mario Clouds right now, because it's like kind of. I, th that is, I think, like oh, the yeah. first so, big work, right? I'm going to bring it up. I think he's maybe, at the time, he was the youngest person to have like a solo at Whitney or something like that, where this was maybe exhibited. Um, and the, the, the story, the headline is uh, he does hardware modifications to the physical uh, cartridges of Nintendo Entertainment Systems in order to reduce the games to sometimes funny, sometimes whimsical artworks, and the most famous one being Super Mario Clouds, in which it scrolls past. However, there was this very dramatic uh, prop up of a dispute on that credibility of that statement in like 2005. There was like a grad student, did you guys follow any of this, who like came to un unveil, un uh, reveal that these were actually, in fact, digital ROMs that had been like uh, loaded back onto the cartridge or something. and. And I don't know if that was just like uh, ever actually part of the original narrative or rather meant to be, but it seems like Corey really embraced it. All of his documentation includes like the updates from this grad student who like pointed out a pixel that was off in order to determine that this was actually a copy of a ROM rather than off of real, real hardware. Real deep lore happening in there. Um, wow. Yeah, so it was this just like an early really version of the like on chain <laughs> argument, like people arguing that Corey's work <laughs> yeah, is, like yeah. not sufficiently not sufficiently yes. burnt into the metal man exactly exactly that's this so isn't great. Even physically programming this is digitally programming so um, here we are we're, and, we're, yeah, we're, I mean, we're looking at super mario being that they are displayed right on the cartridge mm -hmm. And um, and yeah, I mean, I think that it's a pretty important feature of it, whether it's modified ROMs that are, you know, hot flashed or whatever the word is onto a cartridge, um, you know, it's still using the hardware of the Nintendo Entertainment System to take the image and convert it to a screen. Um, and so that's a big part of the display is just seeing this dinky, hella beige, gray box in the middle of the room next to a, a projector, usually of, of the, the cloud scrolling. And, and that was... You know, you mentioned the Paper Rad collaboration, Travis, that I had never seen actually before, or at least not in the ROM version. Uh, another modified Mario that he had collaborated with Paper Rad. That's it's like a music video, or it's called a Mario movie, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the music is a really too. crazy feeling. To like, it's really good, but to like watch a video that you know is being like generated in real time from software. You know, even if it is uh, very prescribed and fixed length, and it's not like it has unique elements every time it plays or generative in that way. Just the fact that it's like, you know, rendered uh, in its like most native format. It's not a copy of video data, which might be transcribed, transposed, scaled up, scaled down, whatever. You know, it's like, oh, this is as close as you can get to like the bare metal of like, what is this image authentically look like? And I, I feel like that's a, a recurring powerful motif in, in various kinds of like software uh, related art is that, you know, even like the SVG, a vector graphic is like as accurate to the intention rather than, you know, pixels that must eventually be displayed to, to do it. You know, there's this core concept that there's a fidelity between the intention and the idea and the eventual outcome that is, is you know, varying degrees preserved 
or not preserved purposefully in various artworks that um, that really came through when watching, you know, when getting a ROM emulator. I mean, again, of course, I'm not even running an, an Nintendo Entertainment System. You're not doing it right now. But mm -hmm. the fact that you're reading the code rather than a copy of the video, it, it comes through. And maybe it's just the fact that you open a different application to do it. But uh, it feels great, actually, to do that. And, and so it gets this into, is like, it. There's... Oh, go ahead, Trevor. Um, I, I have, I don't know, do we have Super uh, Mario movie lined up at all? Yeah, or, yeah, you want to do, I, I, got, I got it, I got it all, I got it all queued up. You want me to bring that one up? Yeah, because I want to kind of keep going off what Billy's talking about. Okay. And that, like, I think that there's been... Except uh, to the clouds, we've all seen them enough, though. Yeah. <laughs> the the idea of uh, level ed level editors um, in Super Mario Maker, right? So Super Mario Maker and Super Mario Maker Two, uh, it's up to the player to design the level. And there's a whole kind of sub genre in that of levels that play themselves, where you have uh, it's like just press forward or just press jump or don't press anything at all, and literally you are kind of bounced from platform to platform by how the person made it. And and it's and so it's like there's this way that people have made started to make animations inside of games mm -hmm. using this idea of just press forward or just press jump um, that feels like it goes back to this like this kind of yet using the game and the that that world to then tell a kind of a story where there is no real agency other than maybe pressing forward or not. I think it's super uh, in in this one. There's you don't press anything, right? Like you this, don't press in anything. Super Mario movie. Yeah, it just goes. Mm -hmm. And um, but yeah, so I when I've been collecting these and I want to share these in another week mm -hmm. as as all these examples of like just press forward or this kind of idea of players making animations and movies out of games. Separate from the kind of Halo, red team, blue team, I forgot that what that genre of uh Machine. Machinima. Yes. Machinima yeah. stuff oh, yeah. separate of that. Yeah. Machinima. God, I forgot yeah. about that word. <laughs> it's funny machinima has has colonized all you know all everything is made in game engines now like or mm -hmm. increasingly yeah it's true right eh? like <laughs> right, i was talking about last week you know you're yeah yeah you're making a movie it's like way easier just to design a game around it and then just do screenshots for it like we we're talking about with the paintings as a possible yeah. step um you can can the can the viewers hear the music on the uh super mario movie yeah, actually yeah the viewers it's, can hear the music such an important component of it. yeah and, and i think that I, I think that you can i'm just trying to make sure it's the right levels because sometimes can, uh, it can. gets too loud i don't think it's playing i don't think it's playing on the youtube actually oh you don't i just turned it up for a second on my other computer it should be coming through for sure I just checked it too. I don't hear it. Technical difficulties. Hmm. Oh, I hear it now. There you go. Now. Okay. So. Great. Um, <clears throat> hopefully it doesn't so turn you guys out. So th I mean, the this level is editor a really... tools for this from the time. How was like? Do you, Billy? Do you have any understanding of like how he was actually doing this? Was he like looking at those like grids of numbers and turning numbers into other numbers? Like how how would uh, how did he go about this? One of his notes in the when I was looking for these on his website the other day and downloading them, one of them had like a reference to. And this one was done in pure binary, so how about that or something, you know, like yeah. a like a G flex <laughs> Jeez, or something? Yeah. I don't yeah. think it was necessarily one of these. But I I mean the limited experience I've had of these sorts of things actually was me trying to hack your game, Mitch, uh when you released Boys <laughs> of Summer. Uh you, you like deployed a, a giant wasm blob and yeah, I, I took that and put it into like a um whatever A sixteen reader kind of thing. You can go through and you can like Tell it to render it and and eight or in, in UTF eight and kind of read things. So I I was guessing that he has some sort of software like that where you can go through it. There could have been at that point some more sophisticated level modification stuff, 
The closest I saw to that kind of stuff for Mario early on was probably around 2009. There was already like a, a level modifier for uh, Super Nintendo for Super Mario 64 that I had been messing with a little bit, and so I imagine. I always think that the like hobby communities around these are, are much bigger than you you realize, and it could be that they already had some sort of visual editor at that point. Uh, it feels like they must have had some system, even if it was a self-developed system for the way they're doing these animations here. Um, so this one, you know, I maybe know... Maybe it's also not as hard as you'd think. Well, this piece, I think, is really unique um, um, among the the all of his video game ROM works, which makes sense, right? Because it's a collaboration with Paper Rad. This is a much more sophisticated um, intervention than most of his other stuff. Because I've, I've listened to him do lectures and something like uh, Super Slow Tetris. I believe Super Slow Tetris may be the one that he talks about dealing with just the binary, but it's because he could find the binary that was just the update, like the cycle update time, and like change one, change one bit on that, and that's the sum of his entire intervention, right? To make Petrus go slower. <laughs> yeah, um, nice. And and most of his ROM hacks are all like reduction. It's all stripping things away. This is the only piece that I've seen that is really additive, that is really taking the clay and, and building something else. And in his notes, he talks about there's some really sophisticated stuff. Uh, if you go to the GitHub, you can see that you know he or, or 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 Paper Rad more likely, based on his history of work, like they made an, a primitive audio synthesizer that would work like within the Nintendo architecture. They made a primitive like animation engine that would work. So there's a lot of custom stuff in here that is not employed in any of his his solo artworks. I I, I think this is. It seems pretty sophisticated to me, um, but I, I don't have a lot of intervention but or, or a lot of experience with this. But it's certainly more sophisticated than some of his other his other hacks. Makes sense. Um, mm -hmm. Also, just great to take a moment to shout out Paper Ad, who, I mean, like you were saying, Travis, Corey, it kind of felt like Corey made all the artwork that you wanted to make in, in college, and, and Paper Ad had a similar feeling, where it's just like, how, how can you ever... How can you compete? <laughs> yeah. Um, maybe it's interesting to talk a bit about humor itself and artworks and like the scale of like the one line versus the like deeply, deeply sadistic humor or something like that. Like I, I think art who takes itself too seriously is obviously like the, the worst case scenario. Um, within that like greater realm of like art that employs humor to some degree, there's like successes and there's failures as too. Um, humor is such a weird thing too, because I think more than most cultural conventions, it changes over time quickly. And I mean, you know, the sort of Overton window is part of that. Also like what's like appropriate to make jokes about. There's this whole question of like humor is sort of about pushing boundaries and like if those boundaries change and either one direction or the other, the humor sort of changes as well. Um, I feel like I've gone back and forth on this like low effort aspect of tech interventions, mm -hmm. you know, where like uh, for one cycle, I'll just be so on board with it. Cause it's like, you know, I'm so sick of like, People flexing technical innovation as like something that's relevant to me caring about whatever they're outputting. And then somebody mm -hmm. who's sort of flippant about that just sort of like nails it. And then like on another cycle, it'll be just like, God, this is so low effort. Like just do something, do something uh, incredible, please. Like I'm so sick of just, you know, uh, doing nothing and walking away and like being snarky and laughing to yourself. And I feel like I've gone through a similar cycle of like loving these works and being like, okay, like I get it. It's a funny one liner, but like, do something for God's sake. And, and maybe Corey sort of escapes it because of the, the, the timeline that you maybe experienced it was at a good moment. But I don't know, how does how does humor for you all factor into these and especially in those timelines and, and with relation to other artworks too? Well, aside from the humor, I can talk about the low effort thing a little bit, which is it really depends on how the artist positions themselves, how they posture themselves and how they present their low effort-ness. Um, I watched a lecture 
that Corey gave. Uh, it was a while ago, so perhaps his feeling has changed on this. But he just self-identifies as being very lazy. He says, well, I do these things because I'm very lazy. I make the art that I make because I'm, I'm very, very lazy. Um, and it's very endearing. Like, he's very, he's very nice about it. It's not... There's that kind of self-effacing low effort. Um, and then there's the kind of low effort where, you know, the person who will give the anecdote about... Well, it cost me one dollar to make the X, and it cost you a thousand dollars for my lifetime of knowing where to make the X. You know, that kind of attitude about the value of one's presumed low effort. Um, it seems to me like Corey Arkinger doesn't position himself like that. But also, there is this other thing where, let's talk about the process of how most of these things would be, would be made, right? He does have the cartridge, and regardless of whether he's, like, emulating, like, the binary code on another computer and then burning it on with a, bur with a bootloader, I will say, even though he often only changes one bit, that process of getting to the point where you change one bit is, it's it's not a thing that I've done, you know. Like I've I've been around like AVRs, you know. I've I've got a I've I've got a whole bunch of Atmel chips in my garage, right? And like setting up the bootloaders and stuff, kind of a pain in the butt. Like you have to do a significant amount of prep work before you have created a space to be lazy in. Um, so they're not obvious like things things to do, I would say. It's um, I I was I was thinking about it like, as as someone like without a background in computer science or programming, uh, it, for me computation and scripting kind of kind of create a moment of magic. Like I'm like ah oh, whoa I can do that I can I can change this thing and kind of flip it and then all of a sudden it's doing this new thing, and uh, that there's like. In, in printmaking, it's like the reveal. It's like after you kind of put everything together and there's that moment where you pull it up and see what you did. It, like there can be this um, reconfiguring or modding something, at least for me, from my side of it, it's just like it can create these moments of like, I just did, all I had to do was that and all of a sudden it's completely changed how the rules of this thing work, right? And so I, th I think that uh, the Billy's fr framing of it around that like laziness or not, I think that depends on who, who who's looking at that um, in terms of their understanding of the underlying structure. Because like I tend to think about it whenever I kind of find my way back the back door into another system, or that as soon as I change anything in it, it's a really exciting moment. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, I mean, I, I guess uh, from one side of that, that totally could be seen as lazy, but. I, I always like I, I position it as like it's also this kind of way of making magic happen where it's just like I didn't know I could do that and now I can and mm -hmm. and it might not be particularly clear right away when you see it that that's that's how it was done. Um, like really points to the kind of like minimalist mentality too, where it's like what is the smallest gesture that I can do that has the largest impact? And you know like um, like like Mitch, you said it, it is actually quite a lot to get in there. And if that's what you want to come through, like just change enough so that that's what comes through. You're like, oh, like that is a chain. We went from zero to one something. Whereas if you really spend the whole time in there, you actually like lose the the point of like, oh, it was hard to even get here. You know, now now I'm wanting you to focus on the changes that I made to think about like those rather than the fact that I made them at all. And and I mean, you know, it's it's it shifts the focus for sure. And and there is, I mean, there's humor in the minimalism thing, but. But it sort of it flips, I guess, depending on the sort of like impact ratio, I guess, uh, about like, you know, did the gesture have a huge impact, even though it was extremely small? Or was the sort of disappointment at that impact the joke? Yeah, I think that that, that resonates with me a lot. I mean, even just comparing the two pieces that we're looking at, right, thinking about clouds and that which is a, this obviously big reduction and is really there's nothing added so it's really clear that the gesture of the artist right is changing this thing right it's like saying we're gonna that that games are something that can be changed and kind of can be touched and i do think that that's like a whereas like this um 
movie piece, it's like very much, there's all this content to think about, right? They're like these Mario drawings and these scrambled sprites and all mm -hmm. this stuff. And, and so you're, it's kind of asking you to read the content as a text more than like the change as a, as a thing. I mean, I feel like for a lot of folks in like a lot of like game developers that I've spoken to talking about their like early, um, that kind of zero to one moment of being like, I could make games, right? Like so many people encountered games, especially in this period where games felt like these kind of magic objects that like appeared fully formed, especially because of the way that they're positioned. There was never, there's not like authorship. It's not, you don't talk about the team or the artists or the author or the director or whatever, especially in this era, right? It was like just this, it was like this consumer product that like appeared as like a toaster, right? We don't know who made the toaster. It was like Mario was kind of like that. Um, and so people didn't, uh, I feel like that's kind of, for me, what was interesting about clouds kind of like in history was that it was this gesture towards games are things that can be like interacted with and, and that are made things made by people and, um, you know, you could do it too, right? It has this kind of punk DIY kind of feeling. And the fact that it's just a reduction also has some of that feeling, right? Some of that kind of punkness of like, hey, you could do this, you know? Um, which was kind of how I took it when I like first encountered it. It was like, oh yeah, we could fuck with these. Like, that's interesting, you know? And, and all the the source, like all the, what he shares, it's like, you get to see all the work. You get to see mm -hmm. all the kind of, which is uh, I felt like another really great part of his practice um, and also like treating source code as this kind of object as well is uh, that's cool I think that's relatively new though I mean I was also really excited to see his github is like well maintained I remember talking to him a while ago I visited his studio and he was working on his archive and uh, I think it was like Gerhard Richter was like his like I wish I could have an archive as complete online database as, as that. And, um, and it seems to be working out. I mean, his website is like actually extremely functional and he's gotten like really good relevant metadata around all of the sort of works and the fact that it's all in GitHub now too. You know, the other GitHub artist that I really love is Damon Zucconi. It's like, yeah. uh, GitHub is probably my favorite website and <laughs> to see, like to just follow his account and to find out about new artworks that he's making through following his GitHub account is such a nice feeling. Um, and yeah, I mean, it preserves every action. It provides such an amazing record of time and interactions that uh, it's really lovely to see the pieces preserved in those, those ways. Um, other so on mention what, with regard to sort of the minimal gesture uh, is is this trend, especially in technology art, to um, make artwork with the latest technology as a sort of stand-in to be, you know, artwork which is pushing the envelope because it hasn't existed before, but only because the technology that it uses hasn't existed before. Um, I think actually there's a really good rant from Brad Trammell about this sort of style of artwork. And I feel like it's a very like tempting format and you see it a lot. Um, and I felt like there was really a moment of this, especially in like the 20, 10 net art area where a lot of people were just like making net art, which was a recreation of artwork that was successful in another format. And you see it in blockchain, especially as well right now, you know, sort of um, doing the first, the first sub, blah, 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 you know, uh, shout out Def Beef's, uh, the first <laughs> NFT to ever <laughs> blah, blah, blah project. Um, but that in that era of the net art sort of going through a similar feature where uh, it was either recreating old artworks or like, you know, with new technology or just doing the first person to do something with new technology, they became a lot of one-liners. I remember mm -hmm. Harm Van den Dorpel was, uh, it was sort of like when he was making some works like that and then like publicly declared he would no longer make works like this, you know, just mm -hmm. like, I don't know if I want to make net art anymore. Like, I don't want to make an artwork in which there was only like one creative decision. You know, I want to, mm -hmm. I want to have artworks in which I make thousands of decisions and like really sort of enmeshing myself and, and how that shows up somewhere on this like uh, lazy, minimal, joke, underperformance sort of thing that there is, there is just kind of one line, there is one punch, you know, and, and mm -hmm. that like, it can be limiting or it can feel limiting if, if sort of done the wrong way or overdone or done too much. 
So then let's ask a question as it applies to this artwork, right? <clears throat> uh, whether it's Super Mario Clouds or this, this piece that we're looking at right now is, is super slow Tetris. So it's Tetris that is that, that only updates the frame every, like instead of updating it every, you know, eight cycles or eight CPU cycles or whatever, it updates, um, it, it, it updates the frame, it refreshes the frame every 80 CPU cycles. Something, something like that. Um, it just makes the game really, really frustrating. First of all, what is, what is the line? In the one-liner, right? Or, or are, are are there more lines? Is it is it a uh, is there more to it than that? Like, how do you think of a work like this, or a work like like Super Mario Clouds? Is it just the gesture, or is there content in here in this thing that I'm looking at? Because this is the other challenging thing about artworks like that is it's just like sometimes when an artwork is just the gesture, like okay, I bust it into I bust it into um, you know, Super Mario Brothers cartridge. I hacked the ROM. I took out everything except for the clouds. And there's artworks where you can just hear about it and then you understand the gesture and therefore you've absorbed really the value of the artwork. Or is there something else there? Is there something important about being here in the, in the work right now? Is there something, something important about me trying to play this game? I mean, I think they all start with that premise that we already sort of discussed about, you know, uh, the, the gesture of getting there, you know, rendering things to begin with, reusing material, and like M Mario being, you know, as, as Matter, you were saying, sort of like such a large, nameless, but like huge cultural substance to sort of like work within. I feel like uh, the difference between that work and this work, in some ways, it's seen in the sort of visibility. You know, we all know Super Mario Clouds, I'd say very few people know about the slow Tetris. And so there's something like super successful about the minimal gesture of the Super Mario, maybe just the whimsical nature of the clouds themselves or identifiability or like, you know, the simplicity, it, it works in a way that, you know, uh, it's a lot easier to transport that idea far and wide, I'd say, than necessarily the Tetris one. I think the Tetris one is funnier. I mean, it seems more like an opportunity for like an actual uh, like one line joke, whereas the other one is like a one line gesture. The joke being that like Tetris is really hard. <laughs> Like, what if we just slowed it down so I could be really good at it? <laughs> <laughs> Except that this version, this version of Tetris, so I like, I am trying to play this. It's, it's equally hard for different reasons, <laughs> right? Like, it's just so, right, right. so I'm even going to, I'm going to hold down. You know how holding down accelerates your piece. This is me holding down. I can actually can get it at a reasonable pace by holding down. Here we go. Um, it's, it's grueling in a, in a totally different way. Um, <laughs> And so, it, like, it's it's funny because I do think that in all of these, there is something more than just the punk DIY gesture. Like, I, I think um, I, I, I think there has to be. I was thinking a lot about how the, the ways that Super Mario Clouds um, in particular, but this piece as well, was really similar to Mountain, which was the first game that we did in our first week, right? And that these are durational meditation pieces. Super Mario Clouds, of course, is not a game, even though it's performed on the Nintendo. It is more or less a piece of video art, more or less a piece of minimalist video art. Um, and in, in that sense, it was, it was like Mountain. And so I started to try to look at it the same way that I looked at, at, at Mountain. Like, is this piece about instilling a sense of meditation is it you know is it supposed to be an experience or is it just a gesture i feel like the thing that's really important there though is that clouds has zero interactivity right mm -hmm. there's nothing you can do whereas mountain actually does kind of almost like tease you with some inter interactivity you have like an interactive camera they hit you with that mm -hmm. uh drawing prompt in the beginning which kind of makes you think that you're going to be able to interact and then they kind of take it away whereas clouds to me is very clear there's no promise of interaction i, I feel like this is kind of the like frustrated interaction of this is kind of interesting right because as you mm -hmm. say like this is a game right so it's kind of taking that idea of like intervening into a game but preserving its gameness. Um, and like, there definitely is something interesting 
in terms of like the whole arc of technology of like smaller, better, faster, cheaper, right? Whereas like this is kind of taking that in the other direction. And like, what is what is Tetris like if it was a turn-based game? What is Tetris like if it was a board game, you know, or a puzzle, you know, like a physical puzzle, that kind of stuff, which to me is kind of like, feels like what this is saying, right? Um, so I think it's kind of interesting in that regard. But yeah, I kind of also... This doesn't really like speak to me uh, the way the clouds piece does. Um, partly because I think it's maybe less clear what it's doing or something. Like the clouds piece is kind of feels kind of bold and decisive, whereas this is a little feels maybe a little more tentative. Well, let's bring up some later pieces that I think work on similar themes of self-playing or difficult to play video games where there is no interaction, but the hint of interaction and see if we can draw some, some conclusions to decide finally, once and for all, is Corey Archangel's art any good? We'll find out after the break. <laughs> Let's do it. <laughs> um, and I'm bring up, this was some other stuff I was really, really excited to find. Um, video game related where are we here we go um various self-playing bowling games um and so these are really interesting because these are um these are not rom hacks he's not making these the same way that he made the nintendo cartridges which actually kind of makes sense because now we're going to be looking at playstation games uh right and playstation 2 games where there are no cartridges to hack right you can't get in and you can't get in and solder more stuff onto the CD-ROM. So what he did is he was working with somebody. I found their website and shout out. Um, uh, I, I should bring that up. And he commissioned the production of this chip right here. And Corey Archangel, he called it TiVo for video games. And I, I, I imagine, I don't know this for sure, but it must have been a similar device that produced the Super Mario tablature book that you've shown us the last couple of weeks, Billy, right? And this is a, a piece of hardware that sits, you know, right in between your controller and the Nintendo or game console. And it's just recording all the data. That's it's just recording all the button pushes, right? Essentially a keystroke recorder. And so these various self-playing bowling games, he hasn't changed the software at all. He has just got these video game TiVo machines set to playback exactly the set of commands that he had done once before. And he says that this is a fairly high effort piece. He says it took him six months to set this all up, presumably to play all of these bowling games terribly once, and then line it up to make sure that like it was pressing start at the right time on the like begin game, you know, set functions thing. And um, we have, we have, we have videos of all these things. Uh, but before we get to them, it's worth looking at the setup of how these things were installed. Cause I think it's relevant that this is really theatrical. Like you see all these consoles lined up and showing all the controllers out there uh, and showing them all with these uh, video game TiVos on. Um, but, you know, we'll look at the, the video playlist and I mean, they, they are really funny. And it also goes through the history of video games. We start with, I don't know, the real Magnavox Odyssey. And he set all these video games up to only gutter, they, they only gutter ball. That's all they do. None of them will ever win. And so as we go through. I forgot about this piece actually. And I'm reminded now how much I loved it when I first saw it and how much I love it now. I actually think I like yeah. it more than the Super Mario Clouds. Yeah. I, mean, I think so too. There's something still so good only... about like being bad at games. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Also, like technically proficient and all these things, but still the being history, bad at games. Is so the really idea cool. of like how random numbers work in games, like how like determinism and non-deterministic actions happen in relationship to bowling, about bowling yourself. But yeah, like and that they are all shown together. That you get this kind of history of it too is like really. Um, I don't know. It, that brings it in for me. Yeah, I also such think an it's like vehicle for technology. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think it's also cool because it's like if we talk about 
you know, obviously games are different from art in the sense that the game has a, a designer and a, and a player and this kind of like play is, to me, this speaks very much to like play as performance, right? Like he's basically made, he hasn't changed the game itself. The games are intact and he's made a recording of his performance. And obviously there's a kind of a joke or a statement in his performance of just only scoring gutter balls, right? There's something, he's definitely like, expressing something through the choices he's making in the games um that that kind of like foregrounds the like performative aspect of play um which i think is kind of cool and interesting and all the decisions here seem right seem to matter it, it's super relevant that stage where this thing was presented he's got all of these screens happening at once and he's got all the consoles laid down and all the controllers on them and it's it's super important that these are not videos. He didn't just record a playthrough of himself doing these games. Like these are performances. They are happening live in real time, just with these prepared like hardware performers, right? Um, and that you know all this. If Super Mario Clouds is it's a puzzle, and I think it's right to ask these questions. You know, like was this all right? Well, like is this just a one liner? Is there any content to the artwork Super Mario Clouds? And I think it's over the course of an artist's career when they go back and revisit themes that they start to reveal that. They start to, re they start to reveal what they were thinking when they made the original piece or how their thinking of it has, has evolved. Um, and it's really important to, 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 to do that because often if actually you cram all the questions, all, all the answers to those questions in the initial artwork right at that moment, um, Sometimes that artwork can become bloated or, or less fun or uh, achieve the condition where they are explaining the joke right away, which never goes well. But here, when I play bowling, I see, okay, this artist is, is making very deliberate decisions about what is a performance, right? What's, what space do they want to perform in, in terms of like this live hardware performance thing? And when I would look at, Mario Clouds, I would ask, okay, how much of this is about like hacky DIY culture? Not hacky is in bad, but like hacker DIY culture. How much of this is about video game culture? How much of this artwork is about drawing on the iconic nature of the Super Mario environment and recognizing that as a real space where people feel like they have inhabited, where people recognize themselves? And, you know, here, just by laying it all out is the history of different video games, um, you know, the, the history of different video game consoles. We're seeing graphic fidelity improve. We're seeing, you know, more complicated GUI interfaces as you control power and spin and whatever else you can control. With this through line being futility in all the games, I see, okay, this artist really actually has a clear sense of what, what they want to say in this medium. I mean, what do you, do you think? Like, that... No, wait, also. Yeah, go ahead. No, no, go. I, I mean, mine's just a tag on. So I'll, I'll just say that it, it, it also makes me think of the, the successful degree of accessibility a lot of these works have, um, where highly technical works to like, what am I looking at? Why is this interesting? You know, do I need to like read a book about the technical history of something in order to finally understand what this artist did that's so mm -hmm. great? You know, that, that's not the case on any of these. You know, you can you can get them so quickly and so easily. And even like with games in general, sometimes you watch somebody play a game and you're like, I don't know, what, what, what is what they're doing difficult right now? I don't even have enough context to be able to like place what's happening and to just like make them all bad at playing games. You're like, oh, cool. Like the level playing field is so low now. Like I'm bad at games. I don't understand technology, but like if I tried to do this, it would look like this. I'm bad. I, I find myself in this, even though I'm like tech phobic or totally uninformed in the context. Like it's still accessible in a way that I, I think is, should, should at least be noted. You know, it's, it's like, mm -hmm. uh, it seems obvious, but so many technical things become hard to access. I mean, I think that's also true of just, I think it's a great point. And I think it's also just true of games in general. Um, you know, most people, uh, if you put a controller in their hands, will be kind of like repulsed and alienated. You know, if if you didn't grow up doing that and you don't have this like thousands of hours of muscle memory of using a controller, you give people a controller and they're just they're just like recoil, you know, 
Um, so that is a kind of a smart, smart decision in terms of like accessibility for him. I mean, I, I wanted to touch, you know, you, you mentioned like futility, um, Mitch, for me, the, I felt like the, the through line was more a theme of frustration and mm -hmm. kind of like, uh, that's like, <laughs> that's how, definitely how I feel watching this gutter ball after gutter ball, <laughs> you know? I find it kind of like demoralizing, you know, like it's and and obviously with the Tetris game, right, that has got to be even not controlling it. Just watching you try to control it. I feel frustrated. Right. Mario, that's or the clouds piece. That's not so clear. But also there is some of that. Right. Like we took this thing that should be this like experience of agency and kind of the pl powerful player and just kind of turned it into a. Uh, an image um i don't know if that resonates with anybody else yeah it is these are <clears throat> the opposite i guess wow well, guy we are we are really succeeding in creating the worst twitch stream of all time like if most people like tune in to watch other people play video games it's like to see them just do an amazing like amazing run do all these feats of things and we are just 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 putting up the worst video game playing live on stream <laughs> um uh and and it is awesome and like i don't know yeah i don't i don't know how much i should how i should read into that i don't know how i should weight that in my assessment of the artwork um but yeah i do know that it's really funny i do know that it is like a complete subversion of what it is that we expect from you know performative you know from any sort of artistic performative uh, performances and especially like you know performances in this tech art world where as you guys were saying there's there's this notion that virtuosity is what makes somebody a really good tech artist right um and and i like all this there's, there's uh... a deflation of that for me, like, so this is 2011, and this is mm -hmm. right around the same time that I feel like, like I, I had a return to games in a big way, mm -hmm. and also kind of understanding the different subcultures of like for games. Like, of course, modding was happening in the 90s and 2000s, and people were doing fan translations of Japanese games in the 90s. But it's like I, I remember I think about like seeing uh games done quick like around this time where mm -hmm. and you have speedrunners who have, are doing all these different wild things in it and it, early on when i started watching it, it might have been 2011 or 2012 like around there there was uh they they started including a tool assisted speed run which was this device this hardware device that would play a game and it was recorded ahead of time as a, a set of instructions and it was meant to beat the game as quickly as possible. And then over time it became more meta where they were building games inside of games by like hacking into it. And it was all happening live through the tool assisted thing. And I think about that object, which was that like that robot that was for the Nintendo that had that like head and everything kind of looks like ET. And that's like the device they used to kind of do it. And I think about, um how Corey has there i love the documentation photos of it there's like an n64 controller with this little hardware mod on top of it with his name written kind of scrawled and like under under uh, uh under uh uh lowercase letters um that kind of just kind of fits into the chip and that that becomes this kind of way of knowing that you're not watching a video that you're like watching mm -hmm. this thing live or that that these kind of tools there and so yeah, there, there's mastery, but there's also um, there's also like I guess this kind of subculture aspect of this of gaming historians. Uh, like I think of like websites like Hardcore Gaming One Hundred and One, where it's just like where they dive deep into like different series or different game developers or different things, and like these kind of blogs that became websites, which became self published books that are collecting all this. And he just is, and Corey was working at the same time of this from this other perspective, and I would love to hear like where how he thinks of these other communities that were around it from different sides mm -hmm. um I, I don't particularly i don't particularly think about frustration with these works um i do think about like this idea of game history of pictorial representation of systems and games and design and how they how they change but they're still the same like yes it has spin but you're still just doing gutter balls mm -hmm. um yeah they're, they're they're jewels um in some way and like 
I don't know. It also gets to that thing of just like um, the big realization that I've had over the last decade that games are a form of entertainment and just like watching someone play a game is, is in many ways f- fulfills a lot of the same things that I like about when I'm playing them. You know, I'm, I'm enjoying watching this. Um, <clears throat> I think this is in line with what you were saying, Travis. There are so many ways to to read this artwork. Yeah, I mean, this is actually just, just such a more layered um, and like a nuanced piece than Super Mario Clouds, which it should be obvious, right? It, it's ten it's ten years later. It's a bigger installation, et cetera, et cetera. But and I wish, um, man, th- this is an episode where I really wish we had Wade Wade Wallerstein in here because there is a way like like this artwork has a layer where you can watch this really just as a piece of like digital anthropology, right? We are just like going through, we are just taking a shovel through all the different layers of, of, of video game history. And this has value as an artwork just for that, like just for the juxtaposition of like the Magnavox bowling all the way up to, 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 to the GameCube bowling, right? Where there's so much that, you know, we can learn about how, people expect to interface with technology differently between the year of the Magnavox 2 and the year of the Nintendo GameCube. Like, that's that's on display here. That's one layer. In addition to the humorous, entertaining performance. And then I think that where we get to... The evolution of the fidelity. Yeah, yeah, the evolution of fidelity. Fidelity to reality. And when you start to establish that, that this is a real, that there is an evolution to this history of how people have, of, of, of how people have interacted with this technology, even just from the visual fidelity point of view, in terms of how we absorb the, the visuals of it, to the, you know, the, the, the control interface point of view and the GUI point of view, mm-hmm. then you start to establish that thing that people who want to write essays about Super Mario Clouds will come back to which is that, you know, that piece was about establishing the video game world as a space, right? That even when you take away everything, even when you take about away Mario and you take away the question block, right? The, the space of, of the game is, is still there. It's immediately recognizable to people and it carries certain connotations and even maybe some emotional weight, right? And that thing that is taken for granted in Super Mario clouds it's made explicit here we're given a through line to follow the ways that these digital spaces exist for people because we we see it evolve that makes sense to me Mm -hmm. i feel like also this is just the thing that i love about any kind of yeah just capturing this stuff just kind of like inadvertently captures all this stuff about the the culture and the moment and and that just makes it valuable in and of itself right mm-hmm. that as a just a little historical you know slice of reality um it's kind of very beautiful this with regard to good boy, that yeah. and what Travis was asking about like how Corey thought of himself in relation to those other communities at the time i mean i can't answer from better any means but just from the way i've heard him talk about some of those like you know ruler nerd communities i think his like goal was always just to like not make them hate him <laughs> i mean there's you know this extractive value yeah. version of it where you go and you take these like cool things and you shine them off and you sell them he's i think he has like a lot of respect there and just like oh these guys are so cool they're probably gonna hate me fuck i need to do as much as i can not to like be a loser to them i love well, the I, I remember... these community to who they're the, like because, hacker uh, the nerd community that builds the mods the, the oh, super yeah. hacker nerds. You know, he's like legible enough that he can be like, oh, like they would not think it was cool if I did this. Um, There's also I like have a to side of it because and it breaks my heart. The hardware mods, like the kind of industrial design of of the modding community, both from an accessibility place where people like build game controllers for using one hand or using their feet instead or using their breath. Like there's, there's, I, or like, I remember because Smash Brothers was like a college game for me where I like, that ended up playing that so much. And then after college learning that there were people that had modified GameCube controllers and kind of chiseled out parts of it so that they could do moves quicker with it. That like, there's all these kind of ways that, uh, 
designed like hardware designs that were coming out of it. Um, I, I, yeah, like a kind of this emergent is, form of this design. Is a great tie back. Great tie back to our conversation earlier about AI versus IA. The kind of like artificial intelligence, augmented intelligence, or like intelligence amplification. You know, the assisted play is very much in the uh, intelligence amplification category there. I think, which preserves the intention of the uh, original creator artist input. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's going back to like our previous like gamer types conversation. Like, I think it's pretty important, especially with something like Super Smash Brothers. It's uh, it's competitive, right? It's this kind of Darwinian, like people are trying to like hack their hardware to be able to squeak out a couple more milliseconds to, you know, to beat their friends or to or to win. You know, I think it's like the the competitive thing is like this crazy refinement function for that kind of stuff. Also social and articulate, like the people that did that would make websites or they would sell these at events and things like it becomes this. Yeah, yeah, it, it, yeah. Um, oh, that seems like a pretty good closing point for our, yeah. our our Twitch today. We still technically have seven minutes, but no, I um, I, 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 I think know. we're good. Any, any territory. I know. I think we're good. I would just I would just say anybody who's who's still watching, um, uh, come talk to us about the episode on the Discord. I'll post a link in the show description, and um, give us some suggestions about other other games to play. We've got some some good suggestions. I'm saying this because I saw on Twitter. We had uh, Objectivity suggested that we should play Mall of Tortured Souls by God by Godman. That was an exciting suggestion because we love Godman. Oh yeah. And we had uh, when we had Red Lion Eye, uh, um, True True Died in the Wool OG Punk, um, uh, requesting the Stanley Parable, and requesting Infinite Craft. So. Always interesting. I would like to do. I'd like to do Stanley Parable just yes. because I know it's so important, and I've never played it. Oh really? Uh, yeah. What? So that would be like yeah. I know, I know. It's like a really important game that I've never played. The funnily, what we could do if we want to do like Davy Reedon specials, we could do that. We could do Beginner's Guide, which weirdly I have played, which is kind of like the second kind of, you know, not in the series, but very similar game that he made. Um, oh. which is great. And you can All play right. in like two hours and get the whole story. So, yeah. Okay, okay but well, we we'll have talk to about it in Twitch, but we love the suggestions. Yeah, come come, come talk to us on the Discord. And uh, all right, thanks everybody for our Corey Archangel deep dive. And we decided, I, I think I, our conclusion was uh, Corey Archangel. Yeah, pretty, pretty, pretty good. Pretty good. Yeah. He's good. Yeah. Pretty good. The verdict is <laughs> good. he's good. I, I have to yeah. say that, yeah, various self-playing bowling games, I think, might be my favorite now from this talk. So. Right on. <laughs> All right. Have a great Thanks weekend, everybody. Thanks. Thanks, y'all. All, All right. Well. Bye.